Oh, it's turned into a beautiful, sunny Sunday. Amen. We're thankful for that. And as you know, we're in this series on one anothering. We're working our way down this banner here to your left, and we're at the bottom of that one. Hard, hard to believe we're already halfway through, aren't we? Um, so this morning, I want to start with a story. One day, a man was seated at a table in an upscale restaurant, and the man proceeded to put his napkin into his collar like a bib. Well, the maitre d' of this restaurant pulled the waiter aside and, and said to him, he said, now, I want you to go to that man and as tactfully as possible, I want you to tell him that he's wearing his napkin in a way that is not done in this restaurant. Got the assignment, right? So the waiter walks over to the man and tactfully says, Sir, would you like a shave or a haircut? <laughs> I don't think that's what the maitre d' had in mind, do you think? How tactful is that, right? Now, as you probably know from experience, confrontation is risky business. Most of us don't like to do it, right? <laughs> Most of us try to avoid confrontation at all costs. When we confront someone, we run the risk of damaging the relationship, right? We worry the person that we're confronting will get hurt or angry. And then what, right? Why is it that admonition is so unpopular in our culture today? Well, probably because our culture is so individualistic and morally relativistic, right? Since our culture prizes individual rights over responsibilities, and since our culture rejects universal absolute moral standards, there's no basis for making corrections in the minds of some people. In addition to that, think about the way pride gets in the way, right? And think about the way that many dysfunctional people have abused confrontation or the way manipulative religious groups have, have abused confrontation and used it for control. So it's not surprising why we are uncomfortable with it and why we try to avoid it. But nevertheless, in the face of our dislike of confrontation and its abuse by some people, God says... It's necessary. And God says it can be very helpful. Now, last week we emphasized the truth that we must learn to accept one another, right? Just as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. But like so many issues that we see in Scripture, there's another truth that brings that truth into balance. And the contrasting, balancing truth for accept one another is admonish one another. So what does it mean to admonish one another? Well, the Greek word for admonish means to, literally means to place on one's mind. In other words, it means to bring something to someone's attention. Some of the ways the word's been translated is, in addition to admonish, is to counsel, to warn, to instruct. It's kind of a part of a group of words that range from correcting the ignorant to rebuking the obstinate. And there's a difference between them. Admonition seeks to correct those who are damaging themselves or damaging others by the things they're doing, the words they're using, right? Their, their actions and behaviors. Biblical admonition involves moral correction through verbal confrontation, but it's motivated by love. Now, there's a whole spectrum of, of ways a person might admonish someone, ranging from a gently raised question about something, right? That's kind of, kind of a way of admonition, but in a, in a very gentle and backdoor kind of a way, right? Right? So there's, there's that side, and then to the other extreme, there's the very forceful and, and, and direct rebuke. 
Now, what Nathan the prophet did when he went to King David and confronted him is kind of something in between those things. More than just a little bit of a question, remember he told him a story. And when David got all riled up about it, he said, you're the guy in that story, right? On, on one occasion, uh, Paul tells us in Galatians 2, 11 through 13, about a time when he had to directly confront the Apostle Peter. Picture that, the Apostle Paul directly confronting the Apostle Peter. And he did it because Peter was wrong, and Peter was leading others astray. Even Barnabas was being swept up into the wrong thing that Peter was doing. Now, in reality, there are few signs of our love for someone greater than our willingness to admonish them, right? To risk rejection and broken relationship, to lovingly confront them for their own good. Love demands that we not let anyone get away with wandering away from God and potentially losing their salvation. And love demands that we hold each other accountable to God's truths. Truths about God's word and really truths about ourselves, right? Now, if admonition is done in the right spirit with the right motive, using an appropriate method, then the person receiving the admonition will be better for it and will hopefully appreciate it and maybe thank us for it. A stronger and closer relationship can be the outcome of proper admonition of each other. And real Christian community cannot be experienced if all there is is acceptance and encouragement and affirmation, even though those are very important things. There's also a place for admonition. That's precisely what Paul envisioned, right? In Colossians 3, that Jalen read for us a moment ago, when he wrote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. And then Paul said something similar in Romans 15 in verse 14. He said, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourself are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, competent to instruct one another. And so from these two texts, we see two very important things that need to be present for there to be effective and helpful admonishment. And the first of those is we need to be characterized by goodness, right? That speaks to the motive for admonition, our love for each other. We're full of goodness and love for each other. And that speaks as well as the overall direction of our spiritual lives. Admonition works best when the person doing it has their own house pretty well in order. Now, none of us are perfect. And so our house will never be in perfect order. And yet, you remember, Jesus said, before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye, probably be a good idea to get that log out of your own eye, right? So get your house in order. And when our house is in order, when, when we're characterized by goodness, we're in a better place to give admonition, and for that person to receive it from us. But secondly, we also have to have a good grasp of God's word, right? And, and Paul speaks to that there in Colossians 3, suggesting that the word of Christ be dwelling in us such that it just overflows in the admonition, in the encouragement, in the singing, and all the, the stuff that we do with each other. And then in Romans 15, Paul suggests that we are competent to admonish each other and instruct each other. Why? Because we have a thorough knowledge of God's word. So truthfully, if we're not learning and growing in God's word, then we ourselves are the ones in need of admonishment. We shouldn't be the ones giving it, right? So if we're not filled with goodness, and if we're not growing in God's word, then we should be the ones that others are admonishing, 
not we the ones that are admonishing them. Let's talk about how to offer admonition. You know, there's no perfect formula for this, right? Um, because there are so many different variables that go into it. One variable is the fact that each of us is unique. Each of us is different. The one giving the admonition, the one receiving it, we're all different. And that's a variable. Another variable is the seriousness of the matter under consideration, right? Sometimes the thing is really serious. Other times it's not quite as serious, and yet it is worthy of, of saying something to someone about. Then, of course, there's the history of your relationship with them. That's another variable. There's the level of spiritual maturity of the person who's going to be receiving that admonition. So, so there's lots of variables. So there's no perfect way to do it or, or, or perfect method for it, right? But there are some biblical principles that I think will help us to be more effective than we might be otherwise. So let's consider these principles. First, prayerfully prepare beforehand instead of reacting impulsively. I think you can see why that's probably a pretty helpful suggestion, right? Anytime we're doing something spiritual, we ought to bathe the thing in prayer, right? And this is an important spiritual thing. We need God's wisdom. We need God's strength. Spontaneous admonition is probably not a great idea, right? It's, it's, it's going to be shooting from the hip. It's, it's going to be in response to some emotional situation. So it's probably not best to do it in that way, but to first pray, seek God's wisdom, and then do it, right? Um, I think you can see why that's important. Secondly, and obviously this goes without saying, admonition should be done with pure motives and with a proper goal. When Paul admonished the Corinthians, he did so, he said, not to shame you, but to admonish you as my dear children. So you get that sense of relationship and love and care and, and, and the right purpose. And, and that comes out as well in the Colossians passage, chapter 1 and verse 28. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. That's the goal, to help each other grow up in Jesus. So there needs to be this, this, this pure motive and proper goal. Number three, admonition should be done in private and face to face. You remember Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Show him the fault just between the two of you. Privacy is important because it makes it easier for the other person not to react as defensively when they're not being called out in public, right? And I think face-to-face -face is important to ensure accurate communication. The words that we use are only a small part of the communication process. There's facial expressions, and, and there's gestures, and there's postures, and there's, there's all this that gets lost, if all you have are the words. That's why a text is probably not the right way to confront somebody, right? Even with all the nice little emojis. An email, right? So even a phone call just gets the voice and the inflections and doesn't get the facial expressions and the postures. Of course, you got FaceTime now, so that's better than a phone call, right? If you can't be face-to-face. Fourth, we should be direct and specific rather than vague, sarcastic, or judgmental. <laughs> direct and specific rather than vague, sarcastic, or judgmental. So let's take it for example. Let's say you need to speak to someone about their parenting. Whew. You talk about a bomb, right? Probably not best to say to them something like, boy, I can see you've become a great parent. A little sarcasm there, right? Better to say something like, can I talk with you about how harshly I've seen you treating your kids? See, see the difference there? 
specific, but it's not sarcastic or judgmental. Or maybe you see someone, say something hurtful to someone else. You shouldn't say to them, I know you said that to hurt him. Oh, you're a mind reader now, huh? Wow. You can see into the motives of people. That's judgmental. Rather, we should say something along the lines of, can we talk about what you just said to Bill? See how that's not judgmental, but it's specific? Can, can we talk about what you just said to Bill? Number five, we should ground our admonition in God's word. And we've already said this in the point a little earlier, but let, let's add a little bit to it. Paul wrote all scriptures, God breathed, and is useful. Hey, how about that? It's useful for something, right? For what? Teaching, rebuking, that would be admonishing, correcting, that would be admonishing, and training is admonishing as well. So God's word, right? Preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, that's admonishing, and encourage. We're going to get to encourage one another a little later with great patience and careful instruction. And then, of course, that Hebrews passage. The word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word has the power in and of itself to penetrate and convict and change a person like nothing else can. So to just share the word and to say, I want you to think about how this might apply to you and what you're doing or what you said or whatever. Um, let the word of God be the source of that penetrating truth that needs to take its place in a person's heart. When we appeal to scripture, we're making it clear that this has nothing to do with us. We're all under the authority and accountability of the word of God. Number six, we need to be as strong as necessary, and yet we should also be empathetic and constructive. Being firm doesn't mean being harsh. Being firm doesn't mean being haughty. All of us are sinners, right? And therefore, we should approach each other with humility and with empathy. Because there go I, but by the grace of God, right? It helps to be ready to encourage, to give practical suggestions. Galatians 6.1, Paul suggested, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a harsh spirit. No. A haughty spirit. No. A gentle spirit. And then finally, I'd suggest that maybe, except in the case of a, of a severe kind of situation, we shouldn't insist on the person's compliance. We should leave it with them, giving them time for reflection, giving them time for God's conviction. Often it takes time for us, doesn't it, to, to get past that initial bristling of our egos when someone admonishes us. If we're getting a lot of resistance and maybe even argument from the person that we're admonishing it's best to back off and say something like, why don't you take some time to think and pray about this? And we can revisit the conversation again later. These principles do not guarantee that our admonition will be well received. But it can help make a difference. So there's the part that we do as the one admonishing. But the biggest part is the part of the person receiving, right? So let's, let's talk about how to receive admonition. There's a right way to offer admonition. There's also a right way to receive it. And first of all, God would want all of us to have this attitude. Welcome correction, right? In the spirit of Christ, in the spirit of wanting to grow in Christ, every one of us should say, please, if you see anything in my walk, in my life,
that doesn't jive with what God wants, don't hesitate to say something to me. Welcome correction. The Proverbs are great, right? Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates correction is, the Bible says it, stupid. So if I'm going to be somebody who just hates correction, is against correction, doesn't welcome correction, the Bible says I'm foolish. Proverbs 17.10 a rebuke impresses a man of discernment more than a hundred lashes a fool. We should respect those who bring admonishment, right? And then finally, listen to advice, accept instruction, and in the end you'll be wise. The person who wants to be wise and the person who is wise welcomes admonition. Number two, consider the admonition as a course correction rather than a personal rejection. You see the difference there? Even in the best of scenarios, admonition is a little embarrassing and painful. But for some of us, maybe more than others, I don't know, admonishment feels like personal rejection of us and our identity. And this happens when we're unable to distinguish between our behavior and our identity, right? Those are two different things. God would want us to, to begin from a place of stability as persons. And that stability comes from knowing that we are loved and valued as people because God made us and loves us and values us. And that others love us and value us. That's our identity. But that's different from the need to be corrected from time to time. There's a difference between our identity and our behavior. Our behavior isn't always good or right. Our identity is always full of value. Number three, look for the truth in the admonition rather than looking for reasons to reject it. And this, of course, runs directly counter to our natural inclinations. When someone rebukes us, we instantly, and sometimes creatively, find reasons to reject what they're saying, rather than listening and thinking about it and contemplating it. So I remember this experience I had early in my ministry here at Wetzel Road, many moons ago. We're out in the old foyer, right? Just after worship service. And there was a visitor there that day who was very odd, very unkempt, long scraggly hair, long scraggly goatee, not necessarily a clean goatee, um, and clothing very tattered. I don't know who this person was, I went up to them after service to greet them and welcome them and discovered that the person was profoundly um, a stutterer. I said, hi, my name is David. What's your name? And it took a long time to get it out. Very difficult. So I was initially taken back by that struggle. But then immediately the person, very first thing they say to me after their name is, you... You are prideful. You are prideful. Immediately, the defense system inside me goes on, right? Goes from zero to five, immediately like... Eh, 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 eh. Thankfully, God said, slow down, David. Because my thoughts are, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to say something? Right? That's what pride says. Thankfully, God helped me to just say, I'm really going to have to think about that. Thank you. Wow. Victory for Dave. Wow. Crazy. That was one time. <laughs> one time. So I hope we can always arrive at that place 
when someone admonishes us to, to rather than, than, than react in a negative way, but to just say, let me, let me, let me think about what you're saying because you, you, you may be right and, and, and I may be r r wrong. Hard to say sometimes, right? I may be wrong. And then finally, when someone admonishes you, thank, thank them from, for loving you enough to want to admonish you. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Words from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. If a friend, a loved one, approaches you with correction, it's because they love you. Proverbs 9 and 8 says, Do not rebuke a mocker, or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. I remember an occasion when Bill Perkins spoke with me a few days after a sermon I delivered. This was probably earlier on as well, many moons ago. And Bill took me aside uh, a few days later and just said, you know, there were some things you said in that sermon that I think were inappropriate. And this is what they were. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that he cared enough about this church that as one of the elders and shepherds, that he was going to protect the flock. And that he cared enough about me and my ministry that he wanted to help me to do better. I remember my mother also taking me aside one day. <clears throat> I was a young adult. She was concerned about someone I was spending a lot of time with because I looked up to this person. I was trying to emulate this person in many ways. But she was concerned about some of this person's attitudes and behaviors. So I listened respectfully. I mean, she was my mom after all, right? That's what you do with your mom. You listen respectfully. I thought she was all wrong. But I told her I appreciate it, and I would give it some thought. Over the course of time, I discovered she was right, and I was wrong. And, of course, I thanked her for her loving, concern, admonition on that occasion and on so many others. It's so important that we learn how to receive admonition with humility. At the same time, it's important for us to learn how to lovingly admonish others, right? There's, there's both sides of that thing. We may be tempted to reject admonition. We may be tempted to turn a blind eye to the need to admonish others. But if we value spiritual integrity before God, and, and if we value relationships with others, then learning how to give and receive admonition is going to be so important for each of us. Let me end with a story about faithful admonition that helped the great man stay on track. You remember Ulysses S. Grant, right? Four-star general of the Union forces during Civil War, became the 18th president of the United States. And John A. Rawlins was Grant's friend. He was also a general, he became Grant's chief of staff when Grant became president. But during the Civil War, no one was closer to Grant than Rawlins. Now, Ulysses S. Grant had a drinking problem. But he had confided in Rawlins and asked for his help. He had confided in him that during the Civil War, during, during this extremely stressful time, he was going to do his very best not to drink anything, any intoxicating liquors at all, to keep his mind clear, to be able to carry out his duties. And he was doing pretty good. But unfortunately, he fell off the, the wagon, so to speak, and, and he got intoxicated on one occasion. And Rawlins confronted him with it, pleaded with great earnestness, that Grant refrained from strong drink, and I quote, for his own sake and the nation's great and holy cause. And Rollins' rebuke was heeded, and Grant was not impaired by drink. 
for the rest of that time forward. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Now, there stands today in the front of the Capitol in Washington a magnificent monument to General Grant. There he sits upon his horse in his characteristic pose, flanked on either side by scenes of battle. But at the other end of the mall, a little to the south of Pennsylvania Avenue, there's a place called Rollins Park. And there stands this very ordinary statue of General Rollins. There might have been no monument to Grant had Rollins not been a faithful friend who held his friend accountable and confronted him when necessary, right? Think about that. Had Rollins not done his part to keep Grant on the right path, to keep him on his horse, so to speak, there might never have been the outcome that became, right? So it was Rollins and his admonition that kept Grant on his horse. And you and I can be faithful brothers and sisters to each other by learning to lovingly give and humbly receive admonition, not so we can stay on our horse, but so that we can stay on the right course, the heavenly course, right? And so allow me to admonish you today. If you have not yet declared your faith in Christ and been buried with Christ in baptism, then you're lost in your sins. And I would admonish you to turn to the Lord. If you are a Christian, but you're not taking your walk with God seriously enough, or you're continuing in some kind of sin, then I would admonish you to repent and turn to the Lord. Renew your commitment to walk in His ways.